Welcome to the Weimar Campus Church. We invite you to join us, not just for this service, but for all the services on this very exciting weekend. How many of you have been blessed so far? Amen. This has been just a true, a true blessing. It reminds me of Luke. You know, he was a doctor, but he was into publishing, just like you are. And he was definitely preaching the gospel because that's uh, what he was writing about. And so we're really grateful that you are with us, Dr. Schwelt. And uh, I have a few announcements uh, that uh, we want all of you to be aware of. Please check the website uh, on a weekly basis for any changes that may be occurring for the Sabbath services. And um, for next week, we are planning to have an indoor service. So make sure that you're watching those announcements online. Also, as it relates to the reservations that you may have to make to make sure that you have a seat. Due to the state regulations, we have some limitations. Um, we also want to make mention of the questions. Some of you already have asked questions, and for those of you that are here, you can ask them, of course, in person. But those that are online, you may text them on the chat box that you have available on YouTube. Or if you go to our church website, uh, wemarchurch.org, then we have a tab that is uh, called Questions. Very simple, can't miss it. And you can type in your questions, and hopefully we'll answer most of them. Uh, probably not this morning, but uh, later on this afternoon. Also, due to the fact that we had uh, some challenges with our live stream yesterday, we asked Dr. Schwelt if he was willing to perhaps give us that presentation once again so we can have it in its entirety, and he agreed to do so. Thank you very much for that. And that will occur this afternoon at 5 p.m. So if you missed it yesterday, if you want to have the entire um, presentation once again, you may have it this afternoon at 5 also want to make sure that you know that we have a presentation this afternoon at 3, uh, 30 is it? 3? At 3, and then another one at 5. So you can plan for those as well as tomorrow morning um, at 9.30. And so you uh, can join them as well. Dr. Schwelt is uh, with us, and as we have uh, our prayer of invocation at the beginning, to invite the Lord's presence to really be with us. I uh, ask that all of you would bow your heads as Dr. Schwelt comes and prays for us as we start the service. Please bow your heads with us. Dear Lord, thank you once again for allowing us to be here at, at Weimar Institute. And please uh, allow your Holy Spirit, as we are about to, to begin the divine service, to come in and to change us and to transform us um, and to open our minds to your plan of salvation that you have given us. In thy name we pray, amen. All right, let me go ahead and say good morning and happy Sabbath to everybody. Y'all truly happy? I see the smiles. Can't really see, but I know you're smiling deep within. But um, I know, I mean, there's just so many to be thankful for. Just so many. I mean, we have so much to be grateful for. I know my hometown in the Philippines right now, there were five typhoons um, within the past three weeks. So we are definitely blessed to be here. Amen? Amen. So it reminds me of uh, Psalms 116 and verse 12. You, got, y all rem y all, you guys remember that verse? Psalms 116 and verse 12, where, where, where David, where he was just so thankful and grateful for all the things that Lord, the Lord has given him. And then he said, Father, what shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits? And as I was thinking about the tithes and offerings appeal this morning, and the reason why he said, what, when you, if you want to ask what those benefits were, it's actually found in Psalms 103. And then... Um, and it'll tell you there, Psalms 103, and in verse 2, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And then it tells you, it outlines what those benefits were to him. And he says, Who forgiveth, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who dissatisfieth my mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like eagles. Like the eagles, the Lord executeth righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. And then he says, he will not chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. And he hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us 
according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high as above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. Isn't that enough, my friends, my family? Isn't that enough for us? I mean, family, God has not only created us, but he has also what? Redeemed us. And he's not only redeemed us, day by day he's still doing what? Sustaining us. Isn't that enough for us to give up all? Amen? Including, I mean, we shouldn't even have an offering appeal. But because of this, we forget all his benefits. And may that be enough for you to give not just your tithes and offerings, but your heart today. Amen? So let's have a, um, before we have a word of prayer, because of this current situation, we will not be going around to collect the tithes and offerings. But there are boxes on the way out. On, your, on my left side, and then you can just put them in there. And, you can put, uh, and also there's a QR code right there, and, or you can just go manually to wemar.church.org uh, under donations. So may God bless you today. Let's have a word of prayer. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just praise you so much for all your benefits, dear God. And truly my heart, and I pray my family's heart, who is under the, the hearing of my voice, will cry out and say, what shall I render back unto you, Father, for all your benefits? And Father, I just pray that you continue to bless us, to bless this church. I know a lot, a lot of people are on the edge because of this, you know, all the current situation, but I praise you and thank you that, so, um, that Isaiah 26 and verse 3 is truly true, that thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon thee. So help our minds to be stayed upon you, especially at a time like this that we're living in. And thank you so much. Bless these tithes and offerings, for we ask it all in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. God bless you. morning children out there watching online good morning adult children here and some younger children um, it is my honor to do a children's story so listen carefully don't need to come up front all right as I was listening to the preacher this morning I was thinking of the sanctuary and the cleansing and I was thinking there's there's another sanctuary I know of and it's a beehive a beehive has so many little members that live in them, maybe 30, 40,000 of them. That's a lot of little critters living in one box. And it's kind of like squarish, and it has the epicenter or like the very center of it, and there's like periphery to it. And every day those little critters fly out of the entrance and go in the fields, and sometimes they pick up a bug, like, like a pest, like a mite. Or sometimes they pick up a bacteria or a virus, and they come back home. And God taught them a very interesting thing. Before you enter into the sanctuary where your home is, right, you go through a maze. The bees make it out of a special substance they collect it from the buds of the plants and from the leaves that are budding. They make this maze, amazing thing, right? And they, they go through this maze, and they rub against the walls of the maze, and guess what happens? They get cleansed before they get inside. God wants us to be cleansed. He wants us to enter the sanctuary, right? Through the pathway that he made us. It seems like a, a very, very complicated labyrinth, right? But as we go through it, we are yielded to the cleansing powers. May God bless you. Stay clean. Let us kneel for prayer. God be in. 
Dear Heavenly Father, how grateful we are to read your word and understand that you really intentionally, deliberately want to live among us. You want to be, in fact, in us. And you desire us to be in you, as we just heard. We're grateful for the sanctuary. And as we enter your courts, we enter your courts with praise. And as we see the altar of burnt offering, we recognize that without Christ, there would be no reason to live. In fact, we would have no atonement. So we're grateful for your Son, whom you have sent, and that we can know him. That the priestly ministry is also extended to the labor where we can be washed. And perhaps things have happened during this week, during one's life, where we want to say, Lord, we are in need of your sacrifice, and we also are in need of cleansing from sin. But you don't just leave us there. It's the beginning of the journey with you. As we enter into the holy place, there we see that you're illuminating the room for us through the candlestick, your Holy Spirit. You also feed us with the showbread, some grape juice, and here we are wanting to digest your, your supper, really your specially prepared meal for us. And so as we feast on the word of life today, we pray that you will nourish us and that we in turn will help others to see that you have the true food of life. We're also grateful that there is the altar of incense. It carries over into the most holy place and the prayers that we are offering, we don't even know how to pray, but our prayers are being translated in a way that Jesus can respond to them. And Jesus, our intercessor, our mediator, our only one, who then brings it before the Father and hears our prayers and responds to them according to his will. So that as there may be a record of our sin on that curtain that separates to the most holy place, that we have that confidence that one day that record will be clean. And as we are in the most holy place, standing in front of your majestic glory, the foundation of which is the law, we realize that there is no other place we have more pleasure, more joy than in your presence. Lord, may we abide in this place at your feet, and may you bless us with your divine love today. Pray for those that are sick. Pray for those that are hurting. Pray for those that have difficulties in their job and maybe have lost their jobs even among us. Pray for those that haven't been able to visit their family members, for those that have been separated. We pray for, for these difficulties of which you know more of than we can speak of now. But we also pray that you will unite us as your body and that all of us as cells of this body will be doing the work that you have committed for us to do and that we will do it faithfully, and that we won't do the work someone else was tasked to do, but that we will do the work you gave us to do, and uh, that we will be so organized that as people are watching, that they realize they're following the instructions of a head, and that is Jesus Christ. So we pray that you will bless us as you have been, that you fill us with your Holy Spirit, and that Jesus will soon come to bring us where he is. That's our greatest desire, so that we can worship you face to face. In Jesus' name, amen. At this point, we are going to be blessed by a musical offering unto the Lord, and uh, we will have that being played by two stringed instrumentalists and accompanied on the piano. We're really grateful that we can have this uh, 
this music with us today. When David played his harp, it doesn't say that he was singing to it, and yet it was so refreshing that the evil spirit went away for King Saul. And so as we are hearing this instrumental music, I pray that you will draw closer to him and bless him for the blessing it is of having music. And uh, pray that you will enjoy it, after which we will have the scripture reading by Lisa Schaefer, and then we'll have the presentation by Dr. Schwell. Thank you.
Our scripture reading today is found in Psalms, Psalm 77, 13. Again, that's Psalm 77, verse 13. Your way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? May God bless the reading of his word. So this is probably the most interesting out of the five talks in my mind, right. and, uh, <laughs> and also the most difficult one to give, because it is the hardest one to follow. Um, and so let us just, uh, it'll be fine. Let's just uh, have a prayer, and God will give us what we need. Dear Lord, please be with us as we delve into this, the most important talk, as I believe and, and I know that this is a message for your people for this time, please help us to understand it in thy name. Amen. Amen. Okay. We're good. Psalm 77. I will meditate also of all thy work and talk of all thy doings. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. So up to this point, we have seen the sanctuary is key to the plan of salvation. Ellen White says in letter 208, 1906, the correct understanding of the ministration in the heavenly sanctuary is the foundation of our faith. She says in the opening salvo of chapter 24 in the Great Controversy, the subject of the sanctuary was the key which unlocked the mystery of the disappointment of 1844. It opened to view a complete system of truth, connected and harmonious, showing that God's hand had directed the great Advent movement and revealing present duty as it brought to light the position and work of his people. Folks, that key that the early fathers of our church were given that opened up that door in that hallway to the great disappointment of 1844 is a skeleton key. For I believe that that key not only opens up the disappointment of 1844, but it also opens up the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. Mm -hmm. And if used appropriately, can also tell us what is about to happen in great detail on this planet and what is about to happen. And that is what I'm about to show you. We've already shown how the sanctuary is in Psalms 23 and in the Lord's Prayer. It is the way that Satan used the Dark Ages to foil God's people. It's also how God took us out of the Dark Ages into the Reformation. It is found in John chapter 1, and as we have shown, it is the blueprint for God's highest creation on the sixth day of creation week, the human body. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? The plan of salvation requires the sanctuary. For God, for Jesus Christ, for Jesus Christ, he had to go through that sanctuary. When he gave the decree through Artaxerxes I in Ezra chapter 7 for the Jews to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the city of Jerusalem in 457 B.C., he essentially forgave them. Now, what was he forgiving them for? They were a stiff-necked people. The Babylonians captured them, brought them to Babylon. And then remember, Babylon was defeated by Cyrus the Great. And Cyrus the Great then ruled. It was the Persian Empire. Daniel, in the most amazing political survival story of all, all time, was the prime minister of Babylon one minute and then became the prime minister of Persia the next. That would be like the secretary of state being the same, going from one administration to the other. Okay? That would be like that. But that's exactly what happened. And it was prophesied that, those, that, that the Jews, the Hebrews, would go back to Jerusalem. But did they go back in large numbers? No, they did not. They stayed. It was easier to stay in Babylon. And God knew that the problems of staying in Babylon were large. If you remember, remember when Samuel said, what is that bleeding that I hear in my ear? That was when Saul did not carry out the strict orders of God and allowed 
Agag, the king of Agag, to survive. Oh, no. Yes, you're right. Who was the king? Who was a descendant of that king? Haman. Haman was going to destroy every single Jew in Persia. And this is why it is important that we understand why God asks us to do certain things that doesn't sound right, it doesn't sound humane, but there is a reason. Because even if we are off by a single degree here, an infinity later will be way off. Okay? We cannot question God's ways. Think about what Job experienced. And so God sees the end from the beginning. And yet, here in Persia where they were, they were sold for 10,000 talents of, of silver. We'll talk about that tomorrow. And yet, God forgave them and saved them. How much, did God, how much did they owe God? How much did Esther and the Jews owe God after they saved them? 10,000 talents of silver. God forgave them in 457 BC and allowed them to go back and rebuild the city of Jerusalem. And so 457 is the date for Christ that begins at the beginning of the sanctuary. And from that point on, we have the 70-week prophecy, which takes us in the middle of that 70th week to the first veil. That is when Christ ascends into the holy place in heaven. And then in 1844, Christ goes into the most holy place. And so Christ had to go through his sanctuary. Those were the dates assigned to his sanctuary, a very, very, very large span of time. But each individual, so he provided the lamb. He provided the labor by being buried. He provided the Holy Spirit through the seven-branch candlestick and a place for forgiveness at the altar of incense and the word of God at the table of showbread. And he is now pleading on behalf of his people against the law that cannot be changed in the most holy place. That is God's travel through his sanctuary. But we also have a sanctuary that we must travel through. For we must go through the outer court and accept Christ's death on the cross once and for all. And we must be buried with him in baptism and raised to new life. And then we must go through the, the, the journey of the holy place. It's a journey of a lifetime. By reading the scriptures and asking for forgiveness at that altar and also receiving the Holy Spirit through the seven-branch candlestick. Until that point when our probation closes and we pass through that veil and stand in the presence of God without an intercessor. That is what we must do. And some of us will be able to go through that sanctuary. Others of us are cut off short before we have that opportunity. Correct? That's a much smaller sanctuary of time, but we have to go through that sanctuary. What stands, what is there? There's a very small and a very large. There's, a, there's an in-between. There's the church. And that is what I want to talk about today. The church. What does Romanosco broccoli have to do with anything? This is where I want to make sure that you're on what I am telling you. Because, again, we are going to go to the second book. What's the second book? You, right, you got it, nature. Did God create Romanesco broccoli? Yes. Even though we don't like to eat it, right? Or maybe some of us do. You love it. Okay, good. <laughs> I don't mind it. Here is a microscopic view of Romanesco broccoli, okay? What do you notice there? I want you to notice something about God. There are, do you notice that there's big bumps? And what do you see on the big bumps? Little bumps. And what do you see on those little bumps? Even smaller bumps. God is taking a pattern, and he's, he can scale the pattern. Just like he can take the, scale, the, the pattern of the sanctuary and make it a big scale for Jesus Christ, but also make it a small scale for us. He can do that. What do you see here? What do you notice? One limb is coming out of that snowflake, but what else is coming off of that limb? Smaller limbs. And what's coming off of those smaller limbs? Even smaller limbs. This is a pattern that Christ the Creator uses. What do you see here? A leaf. Do you see a stem? And what's coming off of that stem? Another stem. And, and, and further and further and further and further. Here on the far left, that is a bronchogram in a lung. I'm very well familiar with that. What do you notice? That there is a bronchus, and those bronchus have subsegmental bronchi, and those subsegmental bronchi have other bronchi until you finally get down to the alveolus. What do you see next to it? A tree. A tree has a trunk and branches, and those branches have further branches, and then it gets to the to the stems of the leaves, and so forth and so forth. What do you see there in the middle? That's vasculature, blood vessels. 
arteries, arterioles, capillaries. What do you see there on the far right? Lightning. All of these things work as something called a fractal. Have you heard of a fractal before? A fractal is something where you zoom into it, it looks the same as if you zoomed out of it. It has the same repeating pattern over and over and over again. Do you know in Job 38, when, when all of a sudden God gets to come in and say, where were you, Job, when X? And where were you, Job, when Y? Do you know what all of those things have in common? Whether it's the clouds, or where the, where the water comes up on the shore, or whether it's the snow that he sends, or the rain that he brings, all of the things that are mentioned in Job 38 have one thing in common. They're all fractals. They're all scalable. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Here's another pattern that God scales. Galaxies. I mean, I could even talk to you about half, half an hour about where they, took a, where they took a telescope and they pointed it in the absolute darkest part of the sky. And they let it sit there and expose. And what they saw blew them away. Because what was there was it was filled with galaxies. What is a galaxy? It's a collection of stars that are spinning. Each one of those particles in there is a star that gives off its own light and it's spinning. But guess what? Each one of those stars may have a solar system and they have planets rotating around it. And those planets may have moons rotating around it. Do you see what God's doing here? He's taking a pattern and he's scaling it, but, but it's all part of one another. So the moon is spinning around the planet, which is spinning around the sun, which is spinning in a galaxy. God is the galaxy. Jesus Christ, have you ever noticed that Ellen White sometimes refers to the Son of God as the S-U-N? Why? Because there's going to be a lot of things that we're going to make sense here. Because he is the source of light. And who is, what is the moon again? The church. She simply reflects the light that she is given. Do you see that? So here, God is at the galaxy stage. Jesus Christ is the sun giving off his light. We are on planet Earth. The moon is the lesser light, and it simply reflects. And then us as individuals, we can even go down further to the atomic level. Those of you who are taking chemistry. Atoms have electrons. And what did those electrons do around the nucleus? They spin. And even the electrons themselves have spin, right? Up or down, right? So this goes all the way down. So from the atomic level all the way up to the galactic level, it's the same pattern. And God has shown that he owns from the smallest atom in quantum mechanics all the way up to the galaxies. So God the Father, galaxy, Jesus Christ is at the sun level. The individual is the atomic level. And we've seen here that we each have to go through our own sanctuary. For each individual one of us, we have our own sanctuary that we have to go through. Jesus went through his sanctuary and is going through it now. 457, 31, 34, 31 AD, 1844. You and me, from the moment we were born, we were in the outer court. And then when we became baptized as teenagers, we were in the laver. And then we move into the, and so forth and so forth. The question is, is does the church does the church have a sanctuary that it must go through? And the answer is yes. And so, what I propose to you is this, and we'll see it. Here's the plan of salvation. We have Christ and individuals going through the sanctuary from left to right. Justification, sanctification, glorification. But just as each one of those patterns was part of a different pattern, so the stem went out, and then off the stem came another branch, and off that... What I am proposing and what I will show you is that since 1844, the church has been going through its own sanctuary. And so there is a sanctuary within a sanctuary. Mm -hmm. How many components are there in, in, the, in the sanctuary? How many rooms are there? Three rooms. There's the outer court, yeah, there's the inner court, and then there's the most holy place. Three, there are three divisions of time. Let's put it that way. So if we take the last division of time, 1844 until the end of time, and we subdivide that into three compartments, 
Now we have a sub-sanctuary. Do you understand what I'm saying here? In other words, if we are to divide the time from 1844 until the, last, until the second coming of Christ into three divisions of time, we will now have the sanctuary that the church is going to go through. Now, this is a chart that is based upon biblical eschatology and Seventh-day Adventist eschatology. It was a chart that was constructed in 1970 by Pastor Gordon Collier. I was born after 1970. I had absolutely nothing to do with this chart. This chart is a very amazing chart. Um, I, I have no stock in the company. It's been now repurposed, and it's now going to be republished. You can find it if you want to get this at ceilingtime.com. Okay, I put that out there in case you want to get it. It's a very large chart. It has amazing information on it. What I'm about to do is I'm about to tell you what are the official beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and Bible prophecy and the writings of Ellen White about what is about to happen on this planet. And then what I'm about to do is I'm going to show you that you can get the very same information from the stories of the Bible. Okay? So notice, the first thing you'll notice is that number one starts at the commencement of the investigative judgment, and number four is the second coming of Jesus Christ. How many compartments did Mr. Collier divide that period into? Three. I had nothing to do with the chart. He did it into three. And what are those four events? Number one, the, investment of the uh, commencement of investigative judgment. The second event is the National Sunday Law. Do we have a National Sunday Law currently? So we must be in the first compartment. We are in the outer court of this sanctuary. The second compartment is from the National Sunday Law to the general close of probation. Let me, let me construct that for you. The general close of probation on here is when the very last person on the planet finally decides for Christ and Christ throws down the censer and comes out of the most holy place. That's number three. And then finally, there's a period of time from the close of probation to the second coming of Christ, which is where the seven last plagues fall. And that's, that's in the Bible. Okay? So let me run through exactly what is supposed to happen. From number one to number two, the first component is where we are right now. So kind of what's supposed to happen there is what's happening right now. The church is justified. The church has not been made up. The only thing that justifies the church is the blood of Jesus Christ. And then what happens is, and, and ostensibly what's going on right now is the, is the judgment of the dead are being judged, okay, is occurring. And then at some point it switches to the living. And there is belief that that will happen around the same time that the National Sunday Law comes in. Why? Because now there is a test. Okay? So we're going to get into some biblical eschatology here. So at the National Sunday Law to the close of probation, that is the second period of time. That is when the latter rain is supposed to fall. And make no mistake, the latter rain does not make you a better person. The latter rain seals you the way you are. Okay? The latter rain seals you. There is a former rain which is falling before number two right now, and there is a latter rain that will fall after. That is the sealing of God's people. Where does judgment begin? From number two to number three. That is the judgment of the living. Where does judgment begin? In the house of the Lord. So there will be a progressive judgment until finally number three occurs. That will start in the Seventh-day Adventist church. And that is the reason why I'm here to talk to you today. Because our close of probation is not number three. Our close of probation is post number two. Do you understand? Yes. That event is known in prophecy as a thief in the night. We're going to talk about that. Finally, so what happens between number two and number three is people in God's church are being sealed, and people are leaving God's church, but people outside the church are coming in and being sealed. That's right. There is going to be a sanctification of what? God's church. This is a... This is, this is a sanctuary that God's church is going through. And so while between number one and number two, God's church is being justified, between number two and number three, God's church is being sanctified. Until finally, God's church is now able to go through that curtain that you cannot come back, and that is that curtain that goes into the most holy place, which is at the close of probation. And now, just as the high priest stands before the presence of God without an intercessor, now our church must stand in the presence of God without an intercessor. Do you understand what I'm saying? How many times does the high priest sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat? 
seven times. How many plagues are there after number three? Seven. Do you understand what I'm saying? So you'll start to see that the events that go on in the sanctuary are going to be parallel to what is about to happen according to what biblical eschatology and the Seventh-day Adventist Church says. So, in other words, immediately after number two, there will be some people who come up in the judgment who are alive and will be sealed. Does that make sense, what I'm telling you? In order for God's church to be sealed, it has to start somewhere, and it's going to start after number two. I believe we're right before number two. That's why I'm talking to you today. Okay? How many have ever been to Leone Meadows? I love Leone Meadows. How many have worked in the pottery arts thing? Right? You work on the, on the piece of clay or whatever, you paint it, and then after you're done, what do you do? You put it in the oven. What happens if you're not done and you put it in the oven? Can you change it afterwards? Right now, we're working on the pots. When the ceiling comes, that's when it goes in the oven. Okay? So notice those four numbers very carefully. Keep in your mind those four events because we're going to be talking very extensively about these three periods of time. Okay? This is where you really, if your neighbor is asleep, wake him up. This is, this is pivotal. The entire weekend pivots around this point. So there they are. I want you to keep those straight. Okay? And there is the sanctuary that we're going to be going through. I'm superimposing it. What I'm making here is a seven-layer cake. I'm sorry, a seven-layer carob cake. And what I'm doing is I'm taking things from the Bible and I am stacking it one on top of the other. And what we're about to do is we're going to say that something in this layer of the cake is going to describe everything vertically. Something in this part of the cake is going to describe everything vertically. And what you're going to start to see is you'll start to see in different stories and in different events, everything's going to start to line up. And you're going to get one complete picture. Imagine if you're about to buy a truck online. Okay? You want to see multiple pictures of this truck. You want to see it from this angle. You want to see it from this angle. You want to see what the back side looks like, the front side. You want to see what the back seat looks like. What does the dashboard? All of these are different pictures, but they're different pictures of one truck. What possibly, is it possible that all the stories of the Bible, or many of them, are different pictures of the same event that is about to occur? Folks, this, what is about to occur right now, let me tell you, it is where Christ will be vindicated. This is the most important event in Christ's life that is about to happen. Everything in the Bible, I believe, is leading up to this event. And what we're going to show you is that the stories of the Bible are telling you from a parallel perspective what is about to happen. And part of those stories that I find, I saw this pattern happen many times, is in the Passover. And if you ever notice about the Passover, when it's described, it's very specific about what happens before the Passover, what happens on the 14th day of the, of the month with the lamb, and then what happens on the 15th when they have the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's very specific about what happened, where Christ was, if it was dark, if it was light, if it was this hour, because I believe those are all pointing us to what is about to happen. So that, and this is, this is, where, I get, this is where it gets confusing, but there are certain days of the Passover that correspond with these three periods of time. There is Nisan 13, which is the day before the Passover. There is the 14th of Nisan, which is when the lamb is slain. And then there's the 15th, which begins the Feast of Unleavened Bread, seven days. And those days, as you know, know as good Seventh-day Adventists, doesn't begin at midnight, it begins at sunset. So therefore, if we were to look, for instance, at the last week of Christ's life, the 13th would be from Wednesday evening to Thursday evening. And the 14th would be from Thursday evening to Friday sunset. And the 15th would be from Friday sunset to Saturday sunset. And what you're going to find out is the events that took place on those days at that Passover, indeed on any Passover, all line up prophetically with what is predicted to happen. Okay, so these are the days of the Passover. Let me, give you, let me give you an example. How many remember what happened in 1888? Okay, so righteousness by faith. That's absolutely correct. So what I'm saying is that the thir I'm going to call that first period of time the 13th. Does everyone understand what I'm saying when I say the 13th? When I say the 13th, that's from 1844 until the Sunday law. When I say the 14th, that's going to be from 
the National Sunday Law to the close of probation. And when I say the 15th, that's going to be from the close of probation till Jesus Christ's second coming. Everyone understand what I'm saying? Okay. This is like high school, college, and university. You guys know that before you can go into college, you've got to graduate from high school. Before you can go to medical school, you've got to graduate with a bachelor's in college, right? God, just like in the sanctuary, you are not allowed to pass the veil until you've completed all the stuff in that compartment. To get from the 13th to the 14th, in terms of the time period, what is it that is necessary to go through there? And I will tell you that righteousness by faith has to happen. Do you know that in 1888, in May of 1888, Jones went to the United States Capitol and argued against a national Sunday law? Did you know that? This was called the Blair Bill. It was in a subcommittee of the U.S. Senate, and he was successful in knocking down that Sunday law. Do you know why he was successful? Because God knew later that year, that very year in October at the General Conference in 1888, that Jones and Wagner's message on righteousness by faith would be rejected. And the, the, the way that you get from the 13th to the 14th is by accepting righteousness by faith. What happened? Righteousness by faith. Righteousness, faith. How was it rejected? Well, this was 1888. It was just about 44 years after they had figured out the scriptures and the Sabbath and the law. Everything was about the law. We are saved by doing the law. That's what they felt. And so they had no problem with righteousness. The problem was with faith. Ellen White said, the law, the law, the law, all you preach about is the law. You need to include Christ. This needs to be Christ-centered. And there was a huge debate, and they rejected the 1888 message. They said, righteousness, yes, we get that. Faith? No. And Ellen White said, we're going to be here for a lot longer. Why? They didn't graduate from the 13th. And that's why we're here. You can take it to the bank that when we see a national Sunday law, it's because God believes we're going to accept righteousness by faith. We're not waiting for God. God's waiting for us. How do I know this? Every single Passover, before any Jew can take place in any Passover, what must all men be? Circumcised. They have to be. Whether it's Joshua at Gilgal or Moses in the Exodus, all of them have to be circumcised. What does circumcision mean? Look it up. Romans 4, verse 11. Look it up. This is where we talk about here a little, there a little. I want you to look up Romans chapter 4. This is now where we see, oh, not, not, it's all fun to see the sanctuary and the pattern. Now we're going to get real. And this is where it actually benefits us. Look at Romans chapter 4, verse 11. Paul is talking about Abraham, how he was counted righteous because of his faith. And he asked the question, was he counted righteous before he was circumcised or after he was circumcised? And what's the answer? It was before, meaning that righteousness by faith is given not just to the Jews, but also to the Gentiles. So what does he say here? In, in Romans chapter 4, verse 11, he says, and he received the sign of circumcision. Why? a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet been uncircumcised. Circumcision in its parallel form. We have to be circumcised in our hearts. When we are, that's when we have righteousness by faith. So how do we get out of the 13th? By accepting righteousness by faith. We're going to talk more about that at the end. Okay, so, we, so now the church accepts righteousness by faith. Now we're righteous. Now we can be sealed. God doesn't want to, everyone's praying for the latter rain. Don't bring the latter rain, please. We're not ready for that. We want the former rain so we can be righteous and then be sealed by the latter rain. Then let the Sunday law come. We're righteous. Let's be sealed. The church moves through. Okay, the 14th, sanctification of the church, Sunday law. We already talked about people going in and out. And then finally, at the close of probation, there's this red line, this door that closes. And it's just a scary thought. Growing up at Advent is this door that closes thing, right? You're going to want that door to close. Because like, God, I can't take much more of this. Close that door. Okay? So the door is closed. Probation has closed. Who wants to be on academic probation? Anybody? <laughs> Nobody wants to be on academic probation, right? 
Close that door. So here you see a door close, and then what follows? A situation where God's people are protected, that nothing, no one can lay a hand on them. We are now in the most holy place. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in Him will I trust. A thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shall thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. That's Psalms 91. You see it? How many times does the high priest sprinkle blood on the mercy seat? Seven times. How many times does... How many plagues are there? Seven. You'll see it over and over again. The 15th represents the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. How many days is the Feast of Unleavened Bread? Seven. Unleavened, no sin. So for that period of seven days, seven plagues, God's people will not have leaven. Do you see how all these things are starting to stack up? How they explain each other? You can get the entire biblical eschatology of Adventism from the Bible. You don't need the testimonies. Ellen White said that. If you knew how to study the Bible. She says, several have written to me inquiring the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message. And I've answered, it is the third angel's message in verity. What is the seal of righteousness by faith? We looked at it. Okay, so now what I want to do, now that we've set it up, I want to go through these stories of the Passover. And you're going to see that when you get into the details of the story of the Passover in the Bible, and then when you bring out Ellen White, wow. Now you're going to get it. You're not just reading about a story. You're reading about your life in prophecy. Because what happens? In Exodus 12, 43, everybody has to be circumcised. Now you know what that means. What is circumcision? It's the seal of righteousness by faith. You cannot, it says, anybody who is within your gates and wants to take place in the Passover, they've got to be circumcised. Nobody does the Passover until they're circumcised. That's like the foot washing before you take of the communion. Okay? Then what happens? On Nisan 14 in Exodus, it says, all leaven has to be out of the house. What's the house? The church. All leaven must be removed. And the word there, the, the, the Hebrew word there is the word sealed. It's there in Exodus 12, 15, 19, 20, and 13, 3 to 7. Has to be, it has to be burned that day by noon. It's got to be out of the house on that 14th. The lamb's blood is applied on that 14th. In fact, the hyssop that is used, the word there is purification. It's sanctification. On this very day, Ellen White writes in Signs of the Times that Egyptians who were God-fearing came into the house of the Israelites in the very same period of time that people in other churches will be coming into the Adventist church. And then what happens? We know from the, from, from the plan that there's going to be a door that closes, right? Right? And we see it in Exodus 12, 22. And none of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning. In other words, go into your house and shut the door. Exactly when we should see probation closing. It's there in the story. And then what happens next is mind-blowing because the very next day, the Israelites are still in Egypt, but they're no longer under the power of Pharaoh. Just like we will still be on earth, but no longer under the power of sin as a church. And then they will allow us to go. And the children of Israel go to the Red Sea. And what happens is, as Pharaoh drives them to the Red Sea, Pharaoh is trying to push them into the sea, it says, so that they will die in the sea. He's using the sea against them. But the sea opens up, and they walk on dry land. The water doesn't even touch them. They escape by a miracle, and then Pharaoh pursues them, and then the water closes up on Pharaoh and kills those that are trying to kill God's people. Do you know what the sea represents? People. Do you know in the end times, religious leaders who demand worship will use people against God's people? Is that what it says? And at the very and, and what, what do we see? A thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand. Not even wet sand. And as they go through, Pharaoh will try to push. These religious leaders will try to push people on, on uh, God's people, and the people will try to kill them. It won't happen. As they go through, though, doesn't it say that the people will realize that they were deceived and they will turn on their leaders? And that's exactly what happens to Pharaoh. 
Here is a story that tells you exactly what is about to happen because it is in detail. How many days did it take the Israelites to go from their home to the sea? Seven days. Seven days. And that is why they celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread for seven days because when they left Egypt, they didn't have time to bake the bread. And there was no leaven. So for seven days until they got to the Red Sea, because what did they get after they passed the Red Sea? Manna. So for seven days they ate unleavened bread, and that is why they celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread for seven days. What were they led by? They were led by the symbol of the Holy Spirit, the fire by night and the cloud by day. Do you know when the, when the death angel came to pass pronouncement of judgment, do you know it was the 15th day? It was the 15th day of the month. Do you know what that means? The moon was the highest and the brightest, and it was at midnight that the death angel came. The moon was right up. The, it couldn't have been higher and brighter at that very moment. What does that tell you? That at the moment that the plagues come, Christ church, which is represented by the moon, will be fully reflecting the light of God. Ellen White uses those same language. She says, many do not realize what they must be in order to live in the sight of the Lord without a high priest in the sanctuary through the time of trouble. Those who receive the seal of the living God are protected in the time of trouble, must reflect the image of Jesus fully. She actually uses the same language as that moon. It was at midnight that God chose to deliver his people. It is at midnight that God manifests his power for the deliverance of his people. Great Controversy 636. But you say, okay, so this is a little bit wonky here, Roger. You can call me Roger, it's fine. <laughs> Are you saying that the 144,000 at the end of time is like the children of Israel marching through the Red Sea? That's exactly what I'm saying. And Isaiah puts a vertical post through that connection because he says, in that day shall the breach, branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious and the fruit of the earth that shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel. And it shall come to pass that he that is left in Zion and he that remaineth in Jerusalem shall be called holy, even every one that is written among the living in Jerusalem. He's talking about the 144,000. When the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and how shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning. 144,000. And the Lord will create upon every dwelling place of Mount Zion and upon her assemblies, here it is, 144,000, a cloud and smoke by day and a shining of a flaming fire by night. Isaiah makes the connection. All right, so that's the first Passover. For 40 years, they don't celebrate the Passover. A whole generation dies. New people spring up, uncircumcised. And now God says it's time to go into the new land. And so what does Joshua do? In Joshua 5, 2 through 9, it's another Passover, so what has to happen first? Circumcision. And they go to Gilgal. You can read it there. And what does circumcision mean? It's the seal of... Righteousness by faith. And only after they get circumcision are they able to, as it says there in Joshua 5.10, celebrate the Passover on the 14th day of the month. It says it right there. And what do they do? How do they celebrate it? They celebrate it by eating unleavened bread because all leaven has to be out of their house by the 14th. At the same time that after the National Sunday Law, God's house needs to start being sanctified. Those that are not going to be, leave the church. Those that want to come in, come in. Do you understand? Okay. And then right at the point in the story where you see, where you expect to see a door closing, right? There's about to be a door that closes, right? We're coming up to it. You expect it. Joshua 6.1. Jericho was straightly shut up. None went out. None came in. It's right there. Every story tells the same story. It's another photograph from a different angle of the same event that is about to happen on planet Earth. Every story in the Bible tells us what is about to happen. Think about this. Jesus Christ is in the most holy place. He's pleading on behalf of you and me against the Father, uh, with the Father. Okay? And then what does he do? He finally drops the censer. He walks out of a very holy place. He picks up his sword. He gathers his troops together and they march toward a rebellious city called Earth in which 
there is just a few remnant people that are loyal to him because they have the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. And they hid the two witnesses in their hearts. Right? Is that true? Joshua. Joshua is about to pick up his sword. But before he does, he sees a man holding a very large sword. He says, are you for us or against us? And what does the man say? He says, I am the Lord of hosts. Take off your sandals because the ground that you are standing is holy ground. So Joshua, whose name actually means Jesus, comes out of that holy place, picks up a sword, gathers his troops, and goes to march on a rebellious city in which there is a small remnant led by Rahab who hid in her house two witnesses. Do you see it? It's amazing. How many, how many times does Joshua march around Jericho? What piece of furniture is out in front? The Ark of the Covenant. We're in the last phase here. How many trumpets in Revelation are there? Seven. How many trumpets does Joshua blow? Seven. This is a picture of what is about to happen. And just as, remember what the two, two witnesses say as, as they leave Rahab's house? Anyone that is in your house and dies, let their blood be on us. But anyone that is outside of your house, let their blood be on them. Do you see that? Again, the Passover is a story of what is about to unfold. But I have news for you. Let's talk about Rahab. This is going to get into the talk this afternoon. It's mind-blowing. Not, not, not as if you're already mind-blown. Rahab. Do you know what Rahab did for a living? Yes, we all know what Rahab did for a living. Is she any different than our church? Was our church faithful to her husband? No way. And so our church is exactly the same as Rahab. But guess what? Rahab repented. And Rahab married a man named Salmon. And she joined the Israelites. And together they had a son named Boaz. And Boaz married Ruth. And together they gave rise to King David, who through two different lines, gave rise to Jesus Christ. Rahab is an ancestor of Jesus Christ. So I can say that a sinful woman, sinful woman who gave rise to Mary, a chaste virgin, who conceived with the Holy Spirit a man-child who keeps the commandments of God and has the testimony of Jesus Christ. Think about that. God takes something sinful and turns it into something perfect. There she is. This one's, going to, this one's going to blow your mind a little bit here. Because I'm going to tell you the story of the Passover before there was even a Passover. Does time matter to God? Is time was created by God. He lives outside of time. So here is another story. How do I know this is a Passover story? I know this because the Jews believe that Isaac was born on Nisan 15. They've written it down in their tradition. And we know that Jesus Christ and two other angels visited Abraham and Sarah a year before Isaac was born. Remember, they told them that this time next year you're going to have a baby. And so therefore, if Nisan 15 is at the time of the Passover, and Isaac was born at the time of the Passover, even though it wasn't called a Passover at the time, and this is a year before, this is a Passover story. So let's apply it and see what happens. The first thing that happens is Abraham is circumcised in Genesis 17. Isn't that amazing? What is circumcision a sign of? Righteousness by faith. We just learned that in, in Romans 4.11. And he was circumcised after he was given righteousness by faith. That was the sign that he had righteousness by faith, right? And guess what? In this period of time, from 1844 to now, when we as a Seventh-day Adventist church are preaching the three angels' messages, guess how many angels come and visit Sarah and Abraham? Three angels. I love it. What is the three angels' message? The first one, the hour of my judgment has come. The second one, Babylon has fallen. The third one, get out of there. Those are the three messages. Let's just face it. Okay? What's the first angel's message to Abraham? It's Jesus. What did he say to him? 
for Sodom and Gomorrah, the hour of my judgment has come. And they sit and bargain, right? But the other two angels go off to Lot in Sodom. And what do they tell them when they get there? This place is going to fall. Get out. It's the same three angels' messages exactly at the time when we're preaching the three angels' messages. Do you see that? Okay. Now, this is, going to be, this is going to blow your mind because even before the angels tell them why they're there, Lot's like, hey, how are you doing? Oh, great. He's, first of all, remember this whole thing about Lot doesn't want them to be out there at night? You've got to come inside. You've got to come. It's interesting because Moses told the children of Israel the very same thing. Get into your homes and close the door. And Lot is saying the same thing. You can't be staying out at night. You need to come inside. It's interesting. But what's even more interesting is that before the two angels tell them about, his mission, about their mission to him, he sits down and he makes them a meal. And what does he make the meal of? Hundreds of years before the Passover. He makes them, look it up, Genesis 19.3. He makes them a meal of unleavened bread. On the very day that he's supposed to be making a meal of unleavened bread. How is that possible? This is Abraham. We are well before the Passover, and yet he's making unleavened bread because this is a Passover story, and it's a story about us. Because what happens next is that the people outside want to have relations with these two angels, right? And so just at the point in the story where you know there's supposed to be a door that closes, what happens? Genesis 19.10. But the men put forth their hand, pulled Lot into the house to them, and shut to the door. There's the door closing again, right at the point where we need to have the door closed. And then what happens? He explains what's going on. Probation has closed. And so Lot is trying to go to his married daughters to explain to them what's happening. And what, what do they look? They're like, you're crazy. Why, can you convince people of the gospel after the close of probation? just like Lot could not convince his married daughters. And so they tarried, and eventually they get out. By the way, the enemies couldn't see. They were blinded at the door. Do you know that the, that the Pharaoh, Pharaoh's army, at the very same point in the story, could not see either? They were blinded by the Holy Spirit. Do you see this? They were blinded. They couldn't see. There was darkness. They could, they were, even though they were just a few hundred feet away, they couldn't get to them because of the Holy Spirit. Sodom and Gomorrah are destroyed with fire and brimstone. There's only one other place in the Bible where you have fire and brimstone. That's Revelation. Lot and his family are saved. Let's talk about Lot's daughters, two of them, the eldest and the younger. And you know what they did in the cave. I mean, they thought the entire world was destroyed. From what they saw, they thought it's just us two daughters and Lot. That's it, because Lot's wife was killed as well. She was turned into a pillar of salt. And so they thought the only way to propagate the human race was the way they did it back in Eden, or even worse. Okay, so could Lot's daughter be considered a righteous woman? No. What was the name of Lot's eldest daughter's son? Anybody know? Moab. Moab gave rise to a people called the? Who was a Moabite? Ruth. So I could say that Ruth was a sinful woman who gave rise to a chaste virgin who conceives with the Holy Spirit a man-child who keeps the commandments of God and has the testimony of Jesus Christ. We could talk about Tamar. We don't have a lot of time. But I'll, I'll skip to the end, because guess what? Tamar was a sinful woman, but she had twins, Pharaz. And guess where Pharaz was? Well, Pharaz was the father of Hezron, who was the father of Ram, who was the father of Amidadab, who was the father of Nashon, who was the father of Salmon. So yes, she also is an ancestor of Jesus Christ, a sinful woman who gives rise to a chaste virgin who conceives with the Holy Spirit a man-child who keeps the commandments of God and has the testimony of Jesus Christ. A sinful woman, doesn't Paul say that I want to present you, the church, to Christ as a chaste virgin? 
The sinful woman one day is going to be a chaste virgin, and she's going to be presented to Christ for the wedding. And that, our next lecture is called The Last Wedding. That's mind-blowing. I'll just give you a commercial for that because every aspect of a woman, the fact that she can get pregnant, the fact that she can give birth, I don't know which came first, God's plan of salvation or God's creation. Well, I know which one came first. But all of that that we just take for granted as just human biology is there for a reason. Oh, yeah. there, is a, there, is a, there is a sanctified reason for all of that that happens, even down to the details that you wouldn't even think about. It's telling us the plan of salvation. This is the most amazing Passover week of all time. This one, more than anything else, tells us in excruciating detail what is about to happen on this planet. And this is where I want to spend the rest of our time, which is quickly evading us. But please stick with me. Because here we have the final week. Of, do you know that the last half of John, the last half of the book of John is on this last week? That's how much real estate John gives in his gospel to this last week. Because what we see here is we see that Jesus Christ on Nisan 13 has the Last Supper that evening. Okay? Right where we would say the National Sunday Law is. Think about this. The Last Supper. The last supper, part of the Last Supper happened on the 13th, and part of the Last Supper happened in the early hours of the 14th. When they went in to have the Last Supper, the sun was up. When Judas left, the sun was down. Doesn't it say, and it was dark? Yes, it was. So I think that Last Supper has a lot to tell us about what is happening right now. When the disciples went in up to that upper room, were they all of one accord? Were the leaders of the church bickering with each other, trying to figure out who was better than the other? Who should sit next to Christ? Who was better? Does this ring true? And yet, Christ knew that they needed to be clean very quickly. We're going to talk about that. But then right after that happened, right after that happened, we had religious leaders in the Garden of Gethsemane using civil authority to arrest Jesus and his followers. Do you see that? And then Jesus Christ was taken from judge to prelate to Pontius Pilate. Over and he was put through trials and tribulations. Was he not? And then what happened was when they could find no fault in Jesus Christ, this guy is perfect. We can't find any fault. When it looks as though the religious leaders are not going to get their way, out comes a counterfeit. A counterfeit who is, who is Christ-like and who the religious leaders clamor for and try to convince as many people around them as possible to vote for Barabbas rather than Jesus Christ. By the way, do you know what the word Barabbas means? Bar Abbas, son of the father. Barabbas, Ellen White says, represents Satan himself. And we know right before the close of probation that Satan himself will personate Christ and will try to lure as many away. Why? Because there will be no legal fault with Christ's people. And as Jesus Christ is hanging on the cross, dying, so too will we be dying to self. And as the Roman guard offers him the Roman wine, and he refuses, so too will we refuse the wine of Babylon. Yes. And then in the most mind-blowing event of all time, as Jesus hangs on the cross, right before we come to the close of probation, as Jesus Christ is hanging on the cross, he says, it is finished. And the inner curtain on the temple rips from top to bottom, and the Holy Spirit, which is the Spirit of Jesus, the Spirit of God, which is in the most holy, leaves that temple, and never again will that structure be used for the remission of sin. And at the same time that that happens, in heaven, right before the close of probation, Jesus Christ, who is standing in the most holy place, will throw down the censer and will come out of that chamber, and never again will that structure be used for the remission of sin. This is not a delusion. 
And then the Roman guard takes the body of Christ and puts them into a tomb and seals the tomb so that no one can touch the body of Christ. At the same time, the sealing will be completed and God's representatives on church, on, on earth, his church, no one will be able to touch the body of Christ with a finger. Do you see how this lines up? Every story is telling us what is about to happen on this planet. And then finally, when the time is done, the first fruits, Jesus Christ is raised from the dead. And because he has conquered death, so too we can conquer death in him. Why Has, has anyone talked about this before? Listen to the words of Ellen G. White as she tells you this. Christ's betrayal, crucifixion. She says, the scenes of the betrayal, rejection, and crucifixion of Christ have been reenacted and will again be reenacted on an immense scale. This is going to happen. So I believe that we are here. And now what I'm about to show you here in the last portion of this is that what is about to happen very, very soon. I, ha I have no idea when, but I know what the next event is on planet Earth, and I'm going to show you, because when we go into that Last Supper, I believe it tells us exactly what is about to happen. So I want you to notice very carefully that, we, that, the, that the line that distinguishes between Nisan 13 and 14 is the National Sunday Law. That happens at 6 o'clock p.m. when the sun sets. Prior to that, we have the judgment of the dead. After that, we have the judgment of the living. And who does it begin with? the house of the Lord, indeed, those who are in that upper room. What happens before is the foot washing. What happens after is the emblems of the Last Supper. Probation is open before that. Probation starts to progressively close on you and me, brothers and sisters, in the Seventh-day Adventist church. God is not going to have people come into his church until his church is ready to accept them. And what do we need to do to get from Nisan 13 to Nisan 14? Solemn are the scenes connected with the closing work of the atonement. Momentous are the interests involved therein. The judgment is now passing in the sanctuary above. For many years, this work has been in progress. Soon, none know how soon, it will pass to the cases of the living. He says, I will come as a thief in the night. Great Controversy 490. So most of this, what I'm getting, if you want to look at this, is from the Desire of Ages, chapter 71, 72, and 76. First of all, we should know that Jesus ate the Last Supper on Thursday night. We are right at the right point. Why? Because Jesus himself was the, la was, the, was the lamb that was slain. He could not, when everyone else in Jerusalem was eating the Passover lamb, Jesus was in the tomb. This happened 24 hours prior. Now, what was the situation up there in the room? They were at each other's throats, and the one that was leading out was Judas. Judas. She says here, there was strife among them. Which of them should be accounted the greatest? This contention carried in the presence of Christ, grieved, and I want you to read this, not about what's happening there, but what's happening right now, because that is happening right now. This contention in the church, carried on in the presence of Christ, grieved and wounded him. The disciples clung to their favorite idea that Christ would assert his power and take his position on the throne of David, and in heart, each still longed for the highest place in the kingdom. They had placed their own estimate upon themselves and upon one another, and instead of regarding their brethren as more worthy, they had placed themselves first. Is this what's going on right now? Take a look around you. It's happening in this world, in the church, in this country, in the world. The request of James and John to sit on the right and left of Christ's throne had excited the indignation of the others that the two brothers should presume to ask for the highest position so stir the ten that alienation threatened. They felt that they were misjudged, that their fidelity and talents were not appreciated. Judas was the most severe upon James and John. So they, they don't, it's not Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper. They actually sat in a circle. And I want you to picture it because here is Jesus sitting at the 1230 position, and then to his left is Judas. That was actually the highest position in that culture. Judas is sitting at the 1 o'clock position. John is sitting at the 12 o'clock position. And everything happens in a clockwise fashion. So Jesus got up and washed his disciples' feet in a clockwise fashion. He washed Judas's feet first. He ended with John. 
the hour of his judgment has come. One hour. Okay? The leaders of God's church were bickering amongst themselves and would not wash each other's feet. Listen to this. Another cause of dissension had arisen. At a feast, it was customary for the servant to wash the feet of the guests. And on this occasion, preparation had been made for the service. The pitcher, the basin, the towel were all there in readiness for the feet of washing, but no servant was present, and it was the disciples' part to perform it. But each of the disciples, yielding to wounded pride, determined not to act the part of the servant. All manifested a stoical unconcern, seeming unconscious that there was anything for them to do. By their silence, they refused to humble themselves. This is where we are right now. This is the state of where we are right now. Okay? There's no way we can go to 14. There's no way. We don't have that seal of righteousness. This is where we are. What's going to happen? I have good news for you. The disciples made no move towards serving one another. Jesus waited for a time to see. This is, the, this is the statement that concerns me. I don't know how much time Jesus is going to wait, but he did so up there in the room. He waited and watched. Nothing changed. Jesus waited for a time to see what they would do. Then he, the divine teacher, rose from the table, laying aside the outer garment that would have impeded his movements. He took a towel and girded himself. With surprised interest, the disciples looked on and in silence waited to see what would follow. After that, he poured water in a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. This action, this action, opened the eyes of the disciples. Bitter shame and humiliation filled their hearts. They understood the unspoken rebuke and saw themselves in an altogether new light. Did they do anything? They didn't do a thing. What made them different? Watch this. This is mind-blowing. Judas was ready to repent. I'm going to speed up a little bit to, to, to get to the point of this. Let me explain to you what happened. Did, did Jesus wash Judas's feet? Did, did Jesus wash the other 11's feet? He did the same action for all of them. Here's the difference. Here's the difference. This is the difference. John on the left side of the screen. Judas on the right side of the screen. Here's the difference that made it. Those 11 disciples knew that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. And because they knew that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, that for him to wash their feet, they realized how sinful and shameful they were. How is it possible that my actions would allow the king of the universe to wash my feet? Judas, on the other hand, looked at what Jesus did and said, there's no way he could be the king of the universe if he would do that. Do you see how one action split? What was it that the 11 had that Judas didn't have? Tell me, what was it? Faith. Faith. And at the end of that, Jesus could say to the 11, you are clean. And Judas, he would say, ye are not clean. In other words, it was righteousness, by faith. Do you see it? That is the model for what is about to happen in the church. Something is going to happen. I don't know what. But it's going to rekindle something that we have never seen before since 1888. Maybe it will happen here. If we ask for the Holy Spirit. So if this is true, then Judas... Judas's probation should have been closed. Correct? Right? Judas, do you know that Judas was the son of a Pharisee? He was the son of Simon the leper. Did you know that? No. It's in the Bible. Judas was the son. At Simon's feast, just before the Passover, on the Wednesday night, that is a mind-blowing dinner, I'll tell you. Because here is Mary Magdalene, Mary of Bethany, washing Jesus' feet. She's the one who has been forgiven the 500. Simon, the leper, has been forgiven 50. And Jesus asks, who's going to love me more? And Simon correctly says, well, the one that owed 500. And then he realizes it cut him to the heart that he realized it. And she owes him 500. And then she breaks the alabaster jar and puts the spike nard on his feet. How much was the alabaster jar worth? 300. In other words, what God is saying with that story is, she owes 500 no matter what she does. It's not going to make up for the debt. 
There's nothing she can do to make up for that debt. She can be owed 500. Anything she does is only 300. It's that forgiveness. Do you see what I'm saying? And Simon, fortunately, sees the light and converts, but his son Judas is lost. Judas grew up in a home with all the red books. Judas was the keeper of the money. He controlled all the money. He had the power. He had all of the privileges that we here in the North American division will have. We have the money, don't we? How many times have you heard that at general conference? I'm not saying that the North American division is Judas. I'm just saying you and I, okay, certainly not. Please, don't say that. I'm saying that you and I, this is a story for us because we live in privilege. We have all of the books. We have all of the testimonies. We have, all, we, we have sat next to Christ for three and a half years. And yet we wonder whether or not Christ really is truly the Son of God. We'll have to see what he does, and that will make our determination. Do you see? So I want to show you something that just, I mean, the foot washing is righteousness by faith. Taking part in the, in the Last Supper is the sealing. When you take part in the Last Supper, the emblems of Christ, which are perfect, go into you. Just like the Holy Spirit, the latter rain comes into you. And if you are good, you're sealed that way. And if you're not good, he who eats unto me unworthily is unto damnation. So the question was, is what happened to Judas? Ellen White says, like Peter and his brethren, we too have been washed in the blood of Christ, yet often through contact with evil, the heart's purity is soiled. We must come to Christ for his cleansing grace. Peter shrank from bringing his soiled feet in contact with the hands of the Lord and Master, but how often we bring our sinful, polluted hearts in contact with the heart of Christ. How grievous to him is our evil temper, our vanity and pride, yet all of our infirmity and defilement we must bring to him. He alone can wash us clean. We are not prepared for communion with him unless cleansed by his efficacy. 13th to the 14th. All were washed and had a change in heart except for Judas. He even washed the feet of Judas who betrayed him. It says, she says here, the mind is energized to break down every barrier that has caused alienation when you, when you get into this thinking. Evil thinking and evil speaking are put away. Sins are confessed. They are forgiven. The subduing grace of Christ comes into the soul, and the love of Christ draws hearts together with a blessed unity. All 11 were unified. Amen. Now that sin is removed, only pure emblems can be used. Christ is still at the table of which the Paschal Supper has been spread. The unleavened cakes used at the Passover season are before him. The Passover wine, untouched by fermentation, is on the table. These emblems Christ employs to represent his own unblemished sacrifice. Nothing corrupted by fermentation, the symbol of sin and death, could represent the lamb without blemish and spot. Judas took that last supper. Judas the betrayer was present at the sacramental service. He received from Jesus the emblems of his broken body and his spilled blood. He heard the words, do this do in remembrance of me. And sitting there in the very presence of the Lamb of God, the betrayer brooded upon his own dark purposes and cherished his sullen, revengeful thoughts. At the feet washing, Christ had given convincing proof that he understood the character of Judas. Ye are not all clean, he said. These words convinced the false disciple that Christ read his secret purpose. Now Christ spoke out more plainly. As they were seated at the table, he said, looking upon his disciples, I speak not all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled, he that eateth bread with me had lifted up his heel against me. And um, the, the disciples did not suspect Judas. The disciples actually thought it was them. Is it me? Have I done it? It's that soul searching that we will be in Jacob's time of trouble. Worried was there any sin that was confessed? The closer you get to God, the less perfect you feel you are. That is the key. So here we are, Simon's Feast at the beginning of Nisan 13, the Last Supper here on Thursday evening. And here we have the beginning of the judgment of the living and the latter rain is being poured out. And judgment begins in the 
house of the Lord. So if this hypothesis that I've come up with here, or has been shown to me, is correct, maybe there's some statement in Ellen White that tells us that truly when Judas got up from that table and walked out, that he crossed the line that he could never go back. And that's exactly what happens. In chapter 72, she says, in surprise and confusion at the exposure of his purpose, Judas rose hastily to leave the room. Then Jesus said to him, thou hast doest do quickly. And then having received the sop, went immediately out, and it was night. What does that mean in our, in our uh, uh, algorithm here? If it's night, what day is it? 14th. Because sunset begins the new day. And the Bible has given us this detail so that we know we're talking about the 14th. Night it was to the traitor as he turned away from Christ into outer darkness. And we know that because it is the 14th that the Holy Spirit is being poured out and put into us just like it was for the disciples when they ate of the bread and the wine of Christ. And because judgment begins in the house of the Lord, it says, until this step was taken, she says, Judas had not passed beyond the possibility of repentance. But when he left the presence of his Lord and his fellow disciples, the final decision had made, he had passed the boundary line. All of these things, friends, are coming together. It's all fitting. Everything that has been published in the Bible for us is for today. It is more for today than it is for when they published it. We don't know who Judas is, but whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. He that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation unto himself. Folks, do you know that when the Jews to this very day, when they come to the 14th of Nisan, they are supposed to gather up any remainder leaven in the house, and they are supposed to take it out of the house, and they are supposed to have it burned by noon on the 14th. Do you know that Judas left that house and he was dead? He hung himself before noon on the 14th. The Lord's Supper is a superposition on the latter rain. We have to be ready for the Lord's Supper, just as we have to be ready for the latter rain. And so here we are. We, I believe, are at the forefront of the National Sunday Law. And when that happens, that is when the latter rain is going to fall. So the close of probation is not this far distant thing. For you to say, I'll get my act together when the National Sunday Law comes in is faulty. That is like being a foolish, sleeping virgin without the Holy Spirit in your land. This is a burden for me that I need to get this message out to this church because something is going to happen. And be, I believe before the Sunday Law comes in, I believe righteousness by faith is going to reawaken. And it's a choice I don't, know what, I don't know exactly when it's going to be, but I believe that that's going to happen. So here we are, closing events chart. The bride, she moves through Nisan 13, 14, and 15. Pray that will we be one of, all of the virgins were sleeping. All of the virgins were sleeping. Some of them had the Holy Spirit. The next talk is going to be talking about that virgin, that virgin that is going to be presented to Christ. And what you're going to see next is this interplay. You guys don't know about a Jewish wedding. It's amazing. When you start to study about how a man and a woman join themselves in the Jewish culture, it is going to tell you such a deep, true love story about Christ and his church. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for your word, your scripture. Amen. Everything about your word tells us one thing, and that is you love us dearly and you want to save us. Help us to understand and to learn and to retain and to put into practice in our lives. In thy name, amen. We are in colloquium still, even though it is the divine uh, worship hour. Uh, any uh, uh, questions, clarifications, uh, comments here? And I don't know if there's anyone online that had the chat uh, questions, but uh, if so, we can look at those too. And while you're thinking about that, um, just a, a notification, our afternoon meeting is at what time? 3.30. Yeah, it's at 3.30. 
And I also wanted to let you know that at five, did you mention it to him? Or, or, so for those who were not able to hear this presentation because of the technology and all that, uh, you can come at five for the opening presentation that was done Friday night and we'll be able to get a recording uh, that way as well. We'll take the online one first. Um, just wanting clarification by what he meant. The Holy Spirit was maternal in its instincts when he was relating it to the mitochondria. All right. So you know what's, so inter Schultz. You know what's interesting about the, the Holy Spirit? It has actual, uh, um, well, let's back up. When God said, let's make them in our image, he made man and woman both in his image. So there's some aspects of God that are maternal and comforting, and there's some aspects of God that are masculine. If you think about the Holy Spirit, it actually has, has, has both, because Mary, through the help of the Holy Spirit, had Jesus. So in that role, what is the Holy Spirit taking on? The more masculine role, correct? Whereas here, what we're referring to is that we were saying that the mitochondria, since the mitochondria is responsible for energy production, it's responsible for beta oxidation, all the things that we'd expect to go along with the seven branch candlestick, because that gives light to the entire sanctuary, <clears throat> that, um, that it was interesting because when Christ said, I'm gonna send you the comforter, that was the more maternal aspect of, of the Godhead. And it's just interesting that the DNA that is in the mitochondria is inherited only from the mother. And, and the reason is very simple. When you have the egg and the sperm, the sperm is so small, there's no mitochondria really to speak of in there. All the mitochondria that you inherit as an embryo comes from your mother's egg. And that's where you, and there are certain genes that have to do with energy production that only come from the mitochondria. It's got its own DNA. So, hope that I, I cleared it up. All right, question uh, back here, or does someone have a, a microphone already over here? Yeah, go ahead, back here. So you mentioned before the Sunday law, we need the righteousness by faith. Number one, how, twofold question. Number one, how can we practically receive the righteousness by faith? And number two, what else do we need to, do, to be doing to prepare for the Sunday law? Okay, so nothing more for people to be running around in a flood with fire extinguishers. Okay? Let's make sure that there's no fires and we're in a flood. So this is the thing. Is Satan doesn't care. Sa Satan doesn't need to wipe out everything completely. He just needs to change it a little bit. So as I was saying at the beginning in 1888, it was righteousness by faith. And the part that they had the problem with was the faith. They had just discovered the Sabbath. They were talking about the law. That's where they got hung up was on the law. It was they were legalistic. And Ellen White says, you need to get away from the legalism and you need to focus on Christ. So they got that afterwards. Then they switched their attention to faith. Faith, 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 faith. What's the problem that we have today? The righteousness part. So there's a lot of people that you'll see a lot of books in the ABC about, well, what's really righteousness? You know, is it really, you know, perfection? Nah. There's this dumbing down of what righteousness means. Let's face it, folks. There's going to come a point where Jesus is no longer going to be in the most holy place. That's the bottom line. And so because of that, remission of sin is not going to be going on. So however you want to, however you want to term it, that's, that's what has to happen. Now, as we'll, we'll talk about later, how we get to that point. That sounds very scary. Like, we've got to be sinless, right? How is that going to happen? By the way, just to go back to that, you know the time when Jesus was in the tomb? That's the one day for the first time in the history of the universe that there was no one standing between man and God because Jesus was dead. And you know what? That's going to happen again. There's going to be a period of time where there's going to be no one standing between man and God in that very period. Isn't that interesting? Okay, so how is that going to happen and why is that going to happen? We're going to talk more about the, the 144,000. I know this is a controversial topic, but it's going to be very biblical-based. Don't ask me if I think the 144,000 is a, lit a literal number. It doesn't matter because at the end of time, no one's going to have a counter. We're not going to do a census, and we're not going to know, okay? So don't worry about that. But um, that's a little bit of your question, is, is understanding that truly we can be righteous through faith, okay? And the works will follow. But um, it's, it's, that's the key, is understanding, is being able to have the mental determination to have both 
righteousness by faith. Yeah. Yeah. All right, praise God. A question from online. At when will Michael stand up? Yeah, so Michael refers to Jesus Christ and him standing up. He will stand up. Here's a, non, here's a political non-answer. He's going to stand up when the last person has made a decision for Christ or against Christ. That's when he's going to stand up. Um, you want a date? Like, what, 2020? You know, no, I'm going to give you a date because nobody knows that. Nobody knows that. And we're going to get into that a little bit when we talk about the wedding. It's really, really amazing stuff. There's a couple of other questions here. Wait for the microphone. Okay, so I'm a bit confused about something. When Jesus was on this earth and he was crucified, the veil was rent. So yeah. there was technically no separation between the holy and the most holy. Mm -hmm. But why are we now thinking in heaven he is in the most holy and there's still a separation? That renting of the veil in the temple was not to say that this also occurred up there, right? Obviously, when that temple was destroyed in 70 AD, the heavenly temple wasn't destroyed. So you can't say that everything that happens to the earthly temple is happening to the heavenly. What that meant was is that God's presence no longer existed in that structure. And that what happened was is that no longer did you have to go through that sanctuary system to be able to get absolution of sin, as you know. Uh, you can read that in Hebrews. He is our heavenly. But at the same time, the Jews had not reached the fullness of the 70th week. There was another three and a half years, and many Jews were converted. Interestingly, on the day of Pentecost, most of those people that were converted were Jews. They had been coming back, and they were there for the day of Pentecost. Interesting, the day of Pentecost is the celebration of the receiving of the Ten Commandments. That's really, because it was 50 days, 50, Penta, 50 days after the Exodus is when they reached Mount Sinai. And so, if you remember the scene when Moses comes down with the Ten Commandments, all of you who are on the Lord's side, come to me. But there was how many people that didn't come? About 3,000 were slain. And then, years later, on the very same day, Christ says, here's the new covenant. You're now slain in the Spirit. The same number, 3,000. You see it? 3,000, old covenant. 3,000, new covenant. It's, it's, I tell you, you start to put these things together, and it's amazing. All right, well, uh, thank you. Was there, was there one more that I missed? Okay, uh, this will be the last. I was just curious. I'm kind of a practical, simple person, and I, want, I was wondering, is it possible to turn our minds off of looking at, am I perfect enough, am I obedient enough? Is there another way that we can achieve this? Because it doesn't seem that works in my life. What I see as a pattern to follow, whether it's Mary Magdalene at Simon's Feast or whether it's the disciples at the Last Supper, all of, them, all of them are thinking about not themselves. What they're thinking about is what Christ, the King of the universe, has done for them. And out of that deep gratitude and understanding of really what you have done, we all put the nail into Christ's hands. So meditate on that. Think about on that. You'll stop thinking about how good you are. And what will happen is the, 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 out of gratitude, just like Mary Magdalene, think about it. Mary Magdalene represents the church. She was caught in the act of adultery, right? Okay, she had how many uh, spirits cast out of her? Seven demons. She was saved by Jesus personally, and she had such a thankfulness, gratitude to Christ, that she didn't, it didn't bother her to go into the, into the presence, even though she was being ridiculed. And out of that, an abundance of, of just love for her Savior, she, had, she thought nothing about breaking this alabaster jar, which we'll talk about, and giving him the spike nard. And so here we see, the, this is an interesting uh, interplay. The disciples, who we know their, th their thought process, because this is just the day before the Last Supper. We already know what's going on. Through, who's the biggest? Who, they look at her, and they see somebody who's legalistic, who's trying to buy something. Look at, look at what she's doing. She's trying to be all sanctified. And they start criticizing her. You could have taken that money and given it to the poor. And this is what happens in our church. People... People maybe don't go somewhere on Sabbath and they're looked at, oh, they're a holy roller or legalist. Mm -hmm. Nobody can read the heart. Nobody knows, right? So it, there's nothing wrong with doing good. And we should never, ever 
degrade somebody for doing good. We don't know why they're doing good. They could be doing good because they're like the disciples who want to show off, and be, or they could be doing good out of the natural abundance of gratitude to their Savior. Yeah. And so she felt like she, was owed, she owed him 500, and the, and the worth of this was 300. And that's what she was led naturally to do. By the way, do you know what Jesus says at the end of that verse? When she goes, she says, go in peace, thy faith has saved you. Thy faith has saved you. Yeah. Thank you. Are you guys enjoying this? Uh, one last question from the online audience. Uh, is there a way that we can get a copy of your PowerPoint? Yeah. <laughs> you tell me who I should send. I've already gotten a few email addresses, but if I send it to a... What? To, uh, Okay, the registrar. So I'll send it, and then ask, you can absolutely yeah, ask the registrar for it. Yeah, and would that be registrar at weimar.edu? Yeah. yeah. So ask uh, the registrar for it, and she can I'd be more uh, than send happy. it out um, to you. So uh, yeah, that would be great. And uh, so we'll um, uh, see the online audience at 3:30. Those who are here, stand by uh, uh, shortly. God bless you.